Stacy, like many people, has written me and asked, did I get a good laryngeal exam? Did my doctor correctly diagnose hoarseness? Stacy's exam uh -huh. looks something like this. And say, doctor says, uh, open uh, your mouth. Good. They put on a headlight and they look in the hole. Now, at least there's a light to see what's going on. But unless the doctor puts in some other piece of equipment, they can't see the vocal cords. I'm Dr. James Thomas, and I'd like to tell you about what I think is the foundation of laryngology, and that is the endoscope. At a minimum, a doctor needs to see physically the vocal cords. And if I can borrow my buddy Bill here, I'll show you why that's impossible with just a headlight. When we look in the mouth, shine a light in, the most we can see is the back of the throat. There's no way to bend your eyes and get around the corner here without something like at least a mirror. So if I put a mirror in here, now I can at least see the vocal cords. The image might be fleeting, but there's the possibility that I saw the problem. However, laryngology has come up with at least three different types of endoscopes which can be incredibly useful. First, the German engineering rigid Hopkins rod endoscope. You can look in this end and the image is a 90 degree image. The light shines down this way. Very clear image and we'll talk about some of the pros and cons to this style. We can also put a camera on a flexible endoscope. In this case, our flexible endoscope is small. It allows us to go through the nose and we can look around corners and see down to the vocal cord. There's some pros to this and some cons to this type of image. And sometimes one can do both of these exams. Now technology is evolving. You know it's not standing still. And there's a third type of endoscope called the chip on the tip endoscope. It looks a lot like the flexible fiber optic endoscope, except that the camera is actually a chip on the tip here. And there's no eyepiece because this is an electronic image transmitted to a processor and then shown on the screen. If we hook any of these endoscopes up to a processor and a stroboscope, we can watch the vocal cords in detailed motion. But each of these endoscopes makes some compromises. Let's start with the rigid endoscope. It was the very first endoscope I used to look at the vocal cords. Well, one of the main issues is that there are things like the tongue or the epiglottis that get in the way of actually seeing the vocal cords. Sometimes the uvula flips in from behind and it blocks our view. And if I didn't mention it, when you stick something in a lot of people's mouths, <laughs> oh, sorry. they gag. Very hard to get a good, long, clear image. Although when we do get it, we can see things in pretty good detail. Another compromise with this endoscope is that one has to focus it. There's a focusing ring here. And while the patient's trying to suppress their gag, you have to quickly bring the vocal cords into view. So that can make things a little bit tough. In fact, let's take a look at an exam from a prestigious institution. A patient brought their exam to me and said, would I look at it and make a diagnosis? And in their six minute exam, let me show you how much time they spent actually looking at the vocal cords. Well, we see tongue, uvula, epiglottis. Here come the vocal cords. And quick, don't blink. There they are, and there's the lesion. Out of six minutes, that's all they saw the vocal cords. Now, at least they recorded on video, and you can go back and look at the key moment and say, okay, yeah, I do see a hemorrhagic polyp on the left vocal cord and some blood in the vocal cord. Still, for the expense of an exam, that's not a very long look at the vocal cord. One of the other issues with the rigid endoscope is it's a fixed perspective. That is, it goes in the mouth, you can't really move it around. You end up looking straight down the vocal cords. You get one perspective of the vocal cords, and sometimes that can fool you a bit. Here's a patient which I examined with the rigid endoscope and then with the flexible, and let's see what detail the flexible adds. Okay, pretty clearly we can see that the right vocal cord is not opening and closing. It's paralyzed. The question is, is it that paralysis or lack of motion the cause of the hoarseness? Well, not really. We'll put in a flexible endoscope and get a different perspective on the same patient. 
Now, by zooming in on the vocal cords, we can see that the right vocal cord actually is much thinner than the left. The ventricle here on the right is much bigger than the left. And now we're getting a sense that there is this great inequality between the two vocal cords. And if we slip in a little bit further so that we can start to look along the edge of the vocal cords, we can further appreciate this discrepancy. And we can see that the right vocal cord is really nothing more than a noodle. There's really no muscle left within this vocal cord. Where on the left side, we can see that the mass is probably 10 to 20 times greater. That's the muscle itself. So the person can tighten and loosen this side, but there's nothing left in this side to tighten or loosen. This side flutters when the person speaks. And as any musician will know, if you have two different strings and they're tuned to different pitches and you blow air through them, you get two different pitches at once, diplophonia. Now we have the reason for the hoarse voice. So I think this perspective of you know, getting this clear view from above, seeing the lack of motion, but adding to that perspective the utter thinness that we can see with the flexible endoscope tells a more complete story as to what's going on in causing the hoarseness. Well, let's transition. Here's a patient where I've looked at them with both the flexible fiber optic and a few moments later with a chip endoscope. Before we even get to the chip endoscope, we can see that with the same fiber optic endoscope, the closer I get, the more light it sheds on the subject and the clearer the image. Let's switch and take the best image and compare it to a chip endoscope. Now we start to get to see detail about these white spots. We can see the little blood vessels on the cord. Essentially, it's a much higher quality image. With the chip endoscopes, there are a couple of manufacturers. I've been using a Pentax scope for a while. I think it gives a very clear view. We can take a look at a rock singer here. We can see that there's hemorrhage. We can see that there's a polyp. If we watch on the strobe, we'll see that one side is stiffer than the other. The left side doesn't vibrate as much. And we have a reason for why they would struggle with making sound during a concert. When Olympus came out with their chip endoscope about the same time, I found they didn't use as much of the screen real estate, so the image was smaller, a little harder to see. This year they brought out a chip endoscope that has an image that's very comparable to the Pentax. There's a light quality difference. I think the Olympus tends to emphasize the blood vessels more so the images tend to look a bit redder. And in fact, the engineers at Olympus have taken advantage of that and they've adjusted the light so that the blood vessels stand out in stark detail. Here's a patient who had radiation therapy, so their blood vessels are a little bit prominent anyways. And if we turn on what's called the narrow band imaging, now we really see those blood vessels quite well, and blood vessels are related to certain kinds of tumors, so this might be a useful product to have if you're looking for tumors on the larynx. But let's go back to Stacy. Stacy, if all the doctor did was look in your mouth, they didn't do even a reasonable laryngeal exam. They were just guessing what's going on. If they looked with a mirror, there's the possibility that they saw something, although the images are probably fleeting. And if they started to use the flexible endoscope, a stroboscope, a rigid endoscope, now we're at least getting to the point where they're likely to have done a good exam. And if they have a chip on a tip endoscope, they can show you this incredible detail on the vocal cords, how the vocal cords vibrate, how they're making the abnormal sound that you're calling hoarseness, then I think you're likely to receive an excellent diagnosis. If you, like Stacy, have more questions about your voice, have a look at voicedoctor.net, where there's more information and photos and videos about your vocal cords and your vocal cord health. I'm Dr. James Thomas.